jump to the radical solution. The radical solution of can the entire thing, the whole system's broke, it was made by people who are um, uh, bigoted or, or, or you know, just trying to help themselves out or whatever, and they're not entirely wrong when they say that. But some of the principles we used were effective. They were improvements of previous models. So throwing the whole thing out, yeah, you get rid of the bad, yay for us, but you also get rid of all the good. And it's way harder to make something good than it is to uh, uh, make it worse. So uh, radicals are people that generally are gripped by what, you, by what you would call an ideology. Uh, an ideology, this isn't an exact definition, this is kind of uh, just a way of knowing how people use them. It's a worldview, uh, but it's often really simple. They'll explain big problems with like one, two, three, four, five, six little simple explanations, which is, as we know now, definitely not the case. People and civilizations are way too complex to be explained by a few simple uh, axioms or things. Nonetheless, uh, when they're gripped by ideology, they believe they have a very simple understanding of the world and a very simple solution for that world. All right? Radicals are not just communists, by the way. I'm going to highlight them because they don't um, probably get enough attention or as much as they should. Uh, but the other side definitely does, and they should as well. So I have kind of what we call a political spectrum of, uh, and I'll use the perspective of you guys here, of the left wing and the uh, right wing. All right, and in the middle, I've got my moderates, or what you call centrists. Now, I want to I want to make a point to note that people that are all the way over here, where you begin uh, adhering to ideologies, there's a very low percentage of them. Like they're like three, four, five percent of the population or less. But they're what you call a loud minority. Uh, and when they come into power, they uh, history notices because what they do is usually so uh, horrific and disastrous that um, it becomes infamous. So you guys actually know a couple of right-wing radicals and extremists that were gripped by a simple explanation for the world. And when they tried to achieve it, they killed millions of people. Yep, Hitler's the greatest example over here. Hitler. So we'll talk about what makes these guys uh, right-wing or not. Uh, Stalin would not be right-wing, actually. He is a radical, though. Where would we stick him, do you think? I can tell you one thing. Hitler hated him, and he hated Hitler. So yeah, he's going to be over here on the left, and we'll talk about why. All right, you also got, um, well, do you guys know any other examples for, for uh, Mao Zedong? Mao Zedong, yeah, where would he go? Uh, right wing. No, he would actually go left. Go left? Yep, he would go left. Uh-huh. Uh we'll, we'll talk about why. And any other guesses for the right? Hitler's a good example. He's good enough, but there's other ones too. All right, um, you would put Hitler over here. You would put anyone uh, that... Oh, Mussolini, for example, he was another fascist that was aligned with Hitler. Uh, any fascists, fascists are going to be over here. Uh, and these are largely uh, either Marxists or anarchists, but we'll, we'll just say Marxists for right now. All right, so what makes the difference between a radical and a moderate is, again, they're usually grouped by an ideology. They think they have some simple explanation for how the world works. Generally, it's something like this. This group of people are bad and need to be gotten rid of. This group of people are good and they need to be promoted and protected and put into uh, positions of, of, of power uh, or protected. All right, I think you guys know the groups for Hitler. So how did he see the group as who's the good, who's the bad? Jews, bad. Yep, uh, not just Jews, by the way. Uh, any any uh, inferior race, yeah. right? So Hitler, for example, divided the world into the good equals, in his case, uh, Aryans, Germans, white people, however you saw it. And the uh, bad group, the ones that need to be eliminated, were anyone that was inferior in race. With disability. Exactly. So that, that it, it was a wide scope of people. Uh, Jews were one. Slavic people were another. Those are like Russians, Ukrainians, and Polish people that are to the east of, um, uh, of Germany. Uh, anyone who was disabled, uh, they believed homosexuals were. There was a big list under there. OK. There's another group you can put over here um, that I almost hesitate to, but, I, but I'll make it so inclusive that I don't think people will be too upset about it. This is where you put anyone that's like radically 
religious in the, in the fact that they think that you have to have this religion or you're going to die, and we are willing to spread that by force and fiat. All right, so you could put uh, radical Christians back in the day, the Catholic Church would definitely be in this category. Like you're either blessed by God or not blessed by God and join us or don't join us or you die. Uh, you could put radical Islamists over here. Uh, any radical religion that believes you have to believe this or you die and anyone that doesn't is a bad person and needs to be gotten rid of, pushed out, or, or, or converted uh, by force. All right, so I put uh, radical uh, religions. So this group, what kind of lumps them together is they think that you are born with superiority or inferiority, or you have to convert to uh, superiority or you know, uh, uh, Islam or Christianity, whatever it might be, uh, or you're, you're doomed to uh, fail, uh, die, etc. All right. Uh, over here, though, it's a little bit different. Same idea. There's a good and bad, but they have different ideas for who is good and bad. And this is why the Marxists go over here. Does anyone know who they think are wholly good? And I mean holy like H-O-L-Y, I mean holy like W-H-O-L-L-Y, like entirely. Like if you look at this race or this class or this religion or whatever, everyone in it is good They're owned. and all of the other people are bad. Their own. Their own, yes. Who did they think of as the, uh, um, their own or the, uh, the superior people? Their country? No, they actually did not like the idea of countries. We'll talk about why after the break. I just want to set this in your mind before we talk about how this actually works. Good guess, but not correct. Okay, I'll tell you this though. They are, they divide the world into good and bad based on class. And I don't mean nobility. What two classes do you think we're talking about in the 1800s and 1900s? What are two classes we've been talking about? Middle, middle, class. Class. middle class and working class, okay. Who do you think Stalin and Mao and all uh, communists or anarchists for the most part thought were the, the bad, the evil ones that were oppressing yeah, people? Nice. And Yes, they thought the middle class or the rich, the bourgeoisie, they had different names for them. What it basically means is um, anyone who is wealthy and owns a lot of things. And they thought the only reason that you were actually wealthy and owned a lot of things isn't because you were uh, super um, um, gifted or had a good work ethic or were intelligent. Right? They didn't believe that you could be born with or granted special abilities. They thought everyone was the same. If everybody's the same and you have more than somebody else, what does that mean? Did you earn it or did you take it? Take it. Yeah, they think you took it. Right. So they think everyone is exactly the same. And if you have any more than any one other person, it's because you took it uh, by force and that makes you immortal. All right. So if I'm an oppressor who has more than you, I only have that because I stole it from you or exploited you. That's the only explanation they have for why I would have more if I was a business owner or uh, a noble or whoever it might be. Okay, so if anyone that has stuff is inherently evil and immoral and bad and needs to be gotten rid of, who do you think is inherently good and moral and should uh, be granted these things? And share that, yeah, the working class. So they thought that wholly the working class uh, were, uh, uh, or the poor, were the ones that were uh, good and moral because they were the ones that had less because they weren't <clears throat> stealing it and taking it from others by force. All right. So what makes these guys radicals on both ends is two things. Number one, they have that simple explanation for the world and they want to carry it out. And in both cases, all it does is kill millions of people and blow up in their face. So they got the simple explanation, simple black and white, good and bad uh, 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 dichotomy. Uh, good and bad explanation and solution. That's what a radical is and does. So you can't reason with them. Uh, they don't believe that there's such thing as an individual that's uh, born with abilities. Uh, if you would ask Hitler why some of these guys did good, he would have thought it's because they were stealing or lying or cheating. If you were to ask Stalin or Mao why these guys did good, it's because they were stealing, lying, or, ch or cheating. Um, there's no such thing as an individual who has abilities. You're either born um, inherently good and equal to others, or you are uh, uh, born uh, inherently bad uh, and in, are inferior and need to be exterminated. Uh, number two is, again, they don't <coughs> acknowledge individuals. They only see you through <coughs> group identity, right? They would see you by your race or religion, black and white. Right? And I don't mean like skin color, by the way. I mean like good or bad, you know, this is the good group, this is the bad group. 
All right. So they would judge you by your skin, perhaps, uh, be it race, uh, or they would judge you by religion in this case. And in this case, they, they judge you based on your actual class. And then they would, they would uh, uh, apply whatever they thought that group was defined by, whether they're immoral and evil, or good and moral, or, or, or um, um, bad and immoral, or, or good and moral. And that's all you were. There's no such thing as somebody that could be working class that's bad, or somebody that could be middle class uh, that's good. They just thought that's what it was. If you were in that class, you were bad by default. If you were in the working class, you were good by default. Just like that. All right. So this is why, by the way, there's so few people over on this side. But when they do actually come into power, it's disastrous. Most people know that's not true. Just look at any group. Look at any religion, any race, any class. Will you find individuals who are uh, perhaps more uh, altruistic or good or moral than others? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. You're going to find some detestable people here, but you're also going to find some detestable people here, right? And if you go by race or religion, same thing. Uh, there's no one race or religion that's, that's good or moral. You're going to have individuals in any of these race or religious categories that are detestable people or regular people or particularly good people. All right, uh, they, they fail to make that distinction. Like I can't look at all white people, all black people, all uh, Muslims, all Christians, uh, all poor, all rich people and say everyone in here is exactly the same and good uh, or bad. It is absolutely not true and, and we know that. And 96% of people know that, which is why they are over here. But these radicals uh, don't share that belief. They think it's good and bad. So the idea is get rid of the uh, bad classes or the bad races and religions and your uh, um, world is gonna be fixed. Right? And we've had groups that have been guilty of this throughout history. Christians did it in the Middle Ages and earlier. Um, uh, uh, Muslims have done it historically too. Obviously now they do it way less, uh, but they were particularly comparable to the Catholic Church, <clears throat> certainly when they emerged in the uh, um, post-classical era. Um, you've also got um, uh, examples of um, uh, classes acting particularly bad, nobility, royalty, the middle class was not behaving very well uh, in the 1800s, at least certain parts of it. So you have examples of this, but it's not everyone in there is holding good or bad. It's individuals in there that may be good or bad. Uh, so you have to fill this out. That's what ideologies don't do, though. They say, you're good, you're bad, get rid of the bad. All right. So you guys kind of understand how, what defines a radical? All right. Because we're going to talk about, you guys already know plenty about Hitler and these guys. So we'll talk a little bit about these guys um, after the break. So now you've got an idea of what uh, an ideology is, a very simple explanation for the world, which are always wrong, um, and that what a radical is. And even though they're a small percentage of people, uh, when they come into power, uh, they're pretty damn uh, dedicated to their idea, and they'll kind of do whatever it takes to achieve it. So we have high death totals whenever these guys take over, but first let me talk about how they came up with these ideas. So it comes from two guys, really, uh, uh, Friedrich Engels and, and mostly Karl Marx. I'll just use Marx as the example. I wrote a book in 1848 uh, called The Communist Manifesto. All right, so these guys are gripped by an ideology. So how are they gonna explain the world? Complex set of individuals and trying to figure out what works best or what? But like a simple black and white, do this and it'll fix the world sort of thing. So Marx and Engels thought that there was a common problem in the world that if you could get rid of it, the world would be essentially better, like a utopia where everybody's happy and has the stuff they want and all that stuff. They thought this was the issue, um, that the middle class, of course, like we mentioned over here, they are inherently immoral and bad. Everyone's the same, according to them, same ability, etc. And uh, the reason why they have more is they stole it and exploited and controlled and oppressed um, the people below them, which are the working class, right? And they are the good. These are the people that were oppressed by the oppressors. Therefore, the oppressors are bad and should be gotten rid of. And he argues, by the way, that this isn't just in the 19th century. This has always been going on. He's always thought that there were two classes that were uh, fighting each other. And the ones that had the power were the oppressors. And the ones that didn't have the power were the oppressed. And they were the moral ones. So he, he argues that going all the way back to the Neolithic times before Rome and all that, that the two groups were uh, masters versus slaves. So history is basically a, a set of class conflict or struggle. So the first one was masters and slaves. Then he thought back in the days of Rome, it was patricians, which were kind of like the rich nobles there, versus the plebeians, which were kind of like the poor peasants um, in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, it was the nobility and the king versus the peasants. 
And now what's the class struggle in the 1900s or 19th century according to uh, Marx? Middle class and working class, right. Or bourgeoisie proletariat as he called them. So if you ever see those names, that's what it means. Proletariat and bourgeoisie. All right, what are they fighting over? If, if I agree, I mean I don't, and hopefully you don't, but if I agree that history can be defined by these two classes fighting over, fighting with each other, what are they fighting over exactly? Power. Power, okay. So what's their means to this group having power and this group not having power? Like money and resources. Yes, yeah, money and resources, okay. And then the, the, the word that he kind of lumps them all together with is this is over private property. That's what he thinks the main issue is. So it's a class struggle or conflict over private property. So he offers this simple solution. If the problem is people owning things and claiming them and keeping them from others, what should I get rid of? Just get rid of private property altogether. All right, is the middle class going to uh, give up their private property or the nobility or anybody else? They're gonna be like, oh yeah, okay, here you go. Here's all my land and money and power and stuff. Here you go, sorry about that. No, they're not going to. So Mark says, if we're gonna eliminate this and make sure nobody owns anything and that everybody shares everything, we have to get rid of private property. Middle class is not gonna let go of it willingly. So we're gonna to have to do what with the middle class? Get rid of them, tell them to go home. Yeah, remove them, right, force them out, be exile, imprison them, kill them, whatever it might be. You guys are joking, but that's actually what they, what they believed and what they're gonna do. We'll talk about what happens when that happens. So yeah, that's the solution. So. Here's his uh, like three-step basic summarized plan for how to do this. So the, uh, the Karl Marx three-step success plan for communism. It's three phases. Number one, the revolutionary phase. This is where the uh, uh, armed conflict and violence, the working class that outnumbers the middle class, rises up and seizes by force all private property. So factories, lands, ships, whatever it might be, uh, mines, they, by force, uh, take them from the middle class. If the middle class gives them up, great. If they don't, put them in prison or kill them. And that's what most, they think, are, are, are gonna end up doing. Uh, and, and it does happen when, the, uh, when this does occur in certain areas. So that's revolutionary phase. Uh, violent uh, uprising by proletariat, the working class, and they seize all of the stuff by force. The middle class gives it up, great. If they don't, kill them, get rid of them, imprison them. Second phase is the socialist phase. So this happens in a country, obviously, because there are countries in the world. So uh, first place this happens is Russia, by the way, it becomes the Soviet Union. Um, so they realize you can't just snap your fingers and have this happen across the entire world. They think you have to do it kind of like country by country, which makes sense, because that's how the world's divided up right now anyway. So uh, each country, temporarily, would have the uh, working class, the proletariat, I'll just do working class, because it's easier for you guys to remember. Uh, the working class temporarily owns all property as a government and then uh, distributes everything to everybody equally. So again, the idea is take all the stuff by force from the middle class, as violent as it needs to be. You got a question? Yes, we're trying to figure out what it's like. Uh, violent uprising by working class. Okay. So taking uh, all of the private property, whether it's money or banks or buildings or factories or mines, whatever it is, taking it by force. If they give it up, great. If they don't, take it by force, imprison them, whatever it might be. Second phase, after they've done this, the middle class is either uh, giving up their stuff or they're dead. Um, the remaining working class people, since you don't have to worry about them being bad because they're all inherently good and moral, I, I erased that part, but just remember that, that they're not going to abuse this. So it's okay for them temporarily, while other countries have these revolutions occur, uh, to uh, control everything as a government and distribute it to everybody equally. So here's all of the land, we'll, uh, and there's a million people, everyone gets a, an equal share of that land. Oh, there's a mine, we split up the mine and all of the uh, um, um, materials in it or, or whatever. All right, so they split it up evenly and they believe that will work and that people will be more productive because everybody's happy and um, um, willing to share. And the third phase is these countries that this occurs in and they become socialist, they try to encourage revolutions in other countries. And once 
every country has had the working class rise up by force and take all of the private property, they can enter the final phase, the communist phase, which no one's ever gotten to, which is where there's no private property in the entire world. So am I gonna have countries anymore? No, because countries are technically private property. It's like, this is the United States, it is not China. So if China comes, tries to come take it, we say, no, it's ours, and we kick them out, or vice versa. So uh, in the communist phase, if there's no private property in the countries, then there's no countries anymore. So there's no countries, nobody owns anything, everyone shares it, everyone works to their own ability, whatever they're good at, and then they share it with everybody else uh, in, in, in exchange for what they need. Uh, so the uh, a borderless world that lives in cooperative communes. No one owns anything, everybody shares, everyone's happy, the world flourishes. What a wonderful picture. <coughs> that sounds great. Why is this uh, doomed to fail? Because it is doomed to fail. And we know it's doomed to fail because they've tried it many times across many decades in many different cultures. Well, like, with the second part of it, people are selfish, so they're not going to Yeah, they unfortunately find out the entire working class is not moral all by itself. There are definitely power-hungry, greedy individuals in any class. So this is going to be a, faulting, um, a faulty system right at the bat. So they're not going to distribute evenly in the first place, or even if they do, it's still not going to work. Um, Remind me, again, why we switched over to free market capitalism. Why weren't people innovating and making more of things before capitalism? Like, why didn't I have peasants going, let's try this instead, or, oh, let's, let's uh, make more of this? Why? Well, yeah, they have no incentive, right? They don't get any reward for it. And that's the case here, too. If I bust my ass for whatever reason, a new way, uh, I might help you, maybe, but I don't actually get anything for my extra work uh, or ability. So two main problems here. Number one, the whole working class is not moral just because they're in the working class. Second problem, people have no incentive to do anything. So I'm not gonna bust my ass and make extra grain if I don't get any of it. Or if I get one extra seed of grain and the other million of you also get one extra seed of grain. It's not gonna happen. Uh, at least not at the rate that you would need it to to keep growing. Uh, so this is gonna be a doomed to fail system. All right, and that's exactly what's going to happen. Every government that this occurs in, you have a revolution of some sort, and you have a socialist phase of some sort, uh, you're going to have a disaster. And we'll talk about why after you get this next slide. Uh, specifically, it ends so disastrously. It's the same formula, too. It's kind of crazy. So uh, did, in the 19th century, Marx and Engels, did they have some truth to what they were saying about how, in some instances, the middle class was oppressing the working class? Yes, there was some truth to it, absolutely. Right, you've got the banning of strikes and unions and the government forced them to go back to work, not act on their behalf. Totally true. Uh, the only problem is it's not entirely true. And I'll show you why Marxism's simple explanation isn't quite correct and why, when they implement it, it's so disastrous. So tomorrow I'll talk specifically about the disasters. Today, hopefully, I'll be able to squeeze in uh, why it doesn't work. So let's pretend this is all the land in the world. All right, I know it's not. But let's pretend it is, or a country, whatever. Um, so you could divide it up like this. How many divided divide it up? What was that, like 36 or so? Whatever it might be. Um, if I distribute it equally, if I have 36 people, that, that's what it'll be. All right, I have 36 to write six by six. Yeah, 36. So if I had 36 people and I divide them up and give them all these lands, that's what it would look like roughly, all right? But common sense tells us this. <clears throat> is everybody equally good at everything? No, right? Some of us are excellent natural basketball players. We're tall, we're quick. We get how to uh, dribble, handle, play defense, and shoot. Those people are great basketball players. And then, of course, you have they go on, and they get better in practice, and they practice other good basketball players. And soon enough, you've got college and professional players that could just trash anybody else uh, in the United States or world because they're naturally good at it, and they practiced. You ain't going to beat them, right? Uh, it's like that with everything, by the way. So let's take farming as an example. If I had 36 people and I made all of them farmers, men and women, you know, it doesn't matter what size or height you are, whatever it might be, everybody's a farmer. Is every gonna, everybody going to be equally good at farming? No. no. Some people won't enjoy it, so they won't care and they won't take care of their crops, so they won't try and find better ways, and it's, it's not gonna be as effective. Some people maybe aren't strong enough. 
Some people maybe uh, just don't understand the mechanics of farming for whatever reason because they're not interested in it or, or whatever. We always are gonna have some people that are naturally either uh, a little better at it, whether it's intelligence or ability, or they like it more, so they put more work effort and um, uh, gain more knowledge about it, and that's gonna make them better over time. So, if I were to take this grid of land and say, all right, here's all the people, and um, let's uh, see what happens as far as how productive they are. So if I had 36 people, let's say I could range from one being a terrible farmer, either they're just naturally not good at it or they really don't like it, so they're not gonna put in a lot of effort, to 10 being, wow, I'm a farmer who has great ability, I can just kinda instinctively understand like how you know the dirty dirt and water works and how to grow things, and I, I really like it, so I put a lot of time and effort into it, uh, and I'm good at it, it's like a 10. All right, so we can all agree that people are gonna range here from one to 10 on how good they are at farming, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, am I gonna have a lot of people that are insanely good or insanely bad? No, most of the people are gonna be somewhere in the middle. Uh, but I will have some people that are super good and some people that are either super bad or super hated and don't wanna do it. All right, so if I just threw the people out there, it would look something like this. I'd have like, you know, maybe a couple tens, maybe some nines, but not very many. Um, and as I get closer to the five and six, which are like the middle, I'm gonna have more and more people. All right, so six. And then it goes back down again, because uh, people that are either really bad at it or really hate it uh, are less and less the further down I go. Oops, I got three, two, one, one, one. All right, so it looks something like that. Slightly more people towards the middle, uh, and fewer people at the end uh, be really bad or hate it or really good and really like it. So over time, uh, who's going to make more food? The tens and the nines, right? And the eights, these guys, I just happen to make this happen, this happen. But these guys are gonna be outproducing these guys, right? Because either they're more gifted for whatever reason or they like it better, so they're more motivated and they go out and they do it better. So over time, I'm gonna have these guys have a bunch of extra food and these guys either don't have extra or maybe they didn't even have enough. So what's gonna happen here if I uh, allow this to go on its own and the government doesn't come in and interfere? What are these gonna do, guys gonna do with their extra food that they have? Okay, they might, but I mean like, what good is it if I'm just sitting on food? I gotta um, use it. Yeah, okay, I could give it to them, right? Out of the goodness of my heart? Maybe, probably not though. What would be a better arrangement for these guys? Yeah, okay, I could sell it to them, right? Or I could perhaps, and this is what actually happens, I could buy that land. And does that person have to be a farmer? Is there nothing else they can do in the entire world? No, no there's other things they could do, right? They could make clothes, they could, uh, uh, we've got a lot of technology now, there's lots of jobs. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of different jobs. If I'm bad at one, who cares? I'll just go do one of the other thousands. I'll be good at one of them, right? Or a few of them. Maybe I'm not good at farming, but yeah. So this guy sells his land to him, right? So he goes off and he is now uh, doing something else, okay? Did this guy just benefit? Did these guys all benefit? Are you sure they didn't benefit? How did these guys all benefit? Yeah, what's he gonna do with this land? Is he gonna make crappy amount of food? No, he's gonna make more. So is that gonna benefit the other people too? Yeah. It is, right, because they're gonna have more food. All right, he's gonna get more and more, or she, whoever, they're gonna get more and more uh, uh, food, and what are they gonna do is they gain more and more excess uh, food and money. money. What are they gonna keep doing? Buying more money. Yeah, they'll keep buying it up from the people that don't wanna do it or are bad at it. So if I let this go for a few decades, what I'm gonna find is the people that are really good and motivated are going to excel and provide more for everybody, that's good. Uh, but they're also gonna be buying out the people that don't wanna do it or suck at it, and these people are gonna go off and do something else. Um, or maybe they end up working for them, whatever it might be. All right, so if I don't touch this, over time, it's not gonna be equal very quickly, because the ones that are good at it are going to get a lot and purchase it from the others who are gonna go off and do something else. That's the good way, right? And we all benefit because then we have the effective farmers uh, uh, um, doing it well. So what happens is, over time, the competent people, the people that are good or motivated, whatever, competent uh, disproportionately own uh, the private property, right? And this could be anything. It could be stores. It could be uh, mines. It could be factories. Whatever it is, this is going to happen. 
So this is good, mm -hmm. right? And this is what uh, free market capitalism takes advantage of. Is that the only possibility, though? Is there any other way these guys that have extra stuff could get the, this land from these people? Do they have to buy it and, and these people have to agree with, to it? What else could they do? Could they, theoretically, use the extra money they bought and use these people as like enforcers or military personnel and take this by force from them because they have more resources than people? Could that happen? Yes. yes. And that does happen, right? But what's important to know is both of these things happen. It's not entirely this, and it's also not entirely uh, tyranny, it's taking things by force, forcefully taking. <clears throat> Marx thinks this is all of it is. Laissez-faire capitalists thinks this is all it is. The problem is it's actually both. So when Marx goes in and all of these communist regimes go in, they think if I have more, it's because of this reason. They're partly right, because yeah, that exists if you don't do anything about it. But they're also gonna wipe out these people, the ones that we actually benefit from, the ones that are good and motivated and actually provide us with more and allow us to do things that we wanna do or we're good at. So the problem's gonna be, yeah, I do get rid of some of these guys, but when I wipe these guys out, everyone else is going to suffer. And the reason why does that classical liberal approach does a better job is over time, we try to weed these guys out, the ones that are monopolizing, using crony capitalism, uh, abusing their power. We try to either make it illegal or punish them and try to promote uh, this over time. And over time, we've done that. But if you go in like a, a Marxist and you just wipe it out from everybody, you're gonna wipe out the ones that are evil and misusing their power, absolutely, but you're also gonna get the people that are innocent that are actually benefiting everybody else. And we'll talk tomorrow about why. When they try this and they wipe both groups out, it kills millions of people, not because they killed them because they took their stuff, because they actually lost food to feed everybody and millions died of famine. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. Let's do a couple review questions first, though. Um, there's kind of like, well, there's technically three approaches to try to make things, to change the economy. Um, well, I guess not change. There's three reactions to the problems in the economy. There's do nothing, there's a gradual approach, and there's a radical approach. Uh, what was the gradual approach used by the U.S. and uh, uh, Great Britain and others? Okay, but how? You're right, you're not wrong about that, but, but how are they doing that? They weren't doing it before, why are they doing it all of a sudden? Because, um, because someone um, came to the economic development, like the military, like the industry is like... Oh, you're right, okay, so you got muckrakers like Upton Sinclair and Jacob Reese exposing some of the conditions, fair enough, okay. So people are, are sympathetic, they see how bad it is, okay. Um, but how are we getting the actual laws changed besides just showing people how bad it is? Which does work, by the way. Um, they're getting the working class to be part of the government? Yes, okay, and do you remember what that's called? That idea where you're opening up uh, voting to everyone? Uh, yeah, classical liberalism, exactly. Uh, it, it's more than just that, but that's definitely a key component of it. It's, it's more about maximum freedom and equal opportunity for everybody. So you're not letting people not vote just because they're you know, poor or don't own, uh, you know, they're lower class, they don't own property, or later on, just because they're women or, or a different race. Um, so yeah, they let working class people in, able to vote, and they show a lot of people um, through publication how bad the conditions are. All right, so the, those, the combination of those two are gonna change things. Um, one thing I wanna ask though is, most working class people can't give up their job and go to London or Washington DC and. Uh, uh, work in Congress uh, because they're not getting paid necessarily, or at least not enough. So um, I understand that some working class people get into the actual government to make changes, which works, but how does just letting them vote for representatives change the way laws are, even if they're not working class per se? How would that work? So think about a city. There's like, if there's three groups of people, like three, Putting into the thirds, it'd be like two thirds are working are not are the working class, and the other one the other one third is the middle class. Okay, yeah. So if I'm if I'm going to be voted in for an area, because that's how Parliament, uh, at least House Commons, and um, uh, uh, Congress work, you in an area vote for somebody to go there and make laws for you. So if most of the people in my area are working class, but I'm not making working class uh, uh, reforms, do you think I'm going to get voted back in? Mm -hmm. No. Who's going to get voted in? 
Yeah, yeah somebody who's supporting the working class, right? So either they be a part of the government themselves, or they're voting for people who uh, support them. So that's their, they're get, gathering a base of constituents, the people that vote for them. Nice, okay, cool. That's the gradual approach. That one's going to work largely, slowly, but it's gonna work because they're, it's not easy to pass a law when you've got middle class people who want something and working class people who want something. Mm -hmm. So seldom does both, does one side like get everything they want. So they have to keep compromising. So it takes a long time to compromise and get changes and sometimes they don't work, sometimes they do. So it takes a really long time, but things do improve. Can we give a couple examples of improvements we see in um, the United States or Great Britain as far as like working conditions getting better or regulations improving something about the Okay, they max it at 10 hours, right? And then later eight hours. Nice, what else we got? Yeah, they ban child labor, which is uh, safer for kids and everyone else in the, the mines and factories. Okay, what else we got? Retirement. Yeah, okay, they start developing either company or state pensions, so that way when people retire in old age, they're still getting um, a flow of money. You guys remember how that works too? You're, as a worker, you're paying into it, and when you retire, you, you sort of collect from it. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's good enough. All right, fair enough. And then they start also regulating um, sa safety and sanitation uh, at these places, having federal government supervisors come in and you know clear you or, 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 or not clear you and shut you down. <clears throat> okay, what's the radical way though? At least the, what's the name of it or the guy that came up with it? The radical solution to fixing things. Was it communism? Yeah, communism Karl by Karl Marx, exactly. Uh, so who did Karl Marx and, and all these radical leftists, who did they... Uh, who do they consider the bad people and who do they consider the good people? <clears throat> um, the bad people that they considered were the middle class because they, they, thought that, they thought like they would oppress the working class uh, and that the working class was like, like <coughs> the Yeah, the good innocent moral. Okay, cool. So they thought middle class people were only successful because they were stealing or taking or exploiting the working class therefore making them all immoral and bad people that needed to be removed, and that the uh, oppressed people, the working class, were the innocent, you know, moral people that uh, if they were freed, that they would, you know, um, ish, usher in uh, this utopian world of no oppression and, and, and all good feelings and, and uh, uh, happiness. Okay, cool. That's a cool solution, I guess. So uh, he has like a three-step program. Um, there's three phases to it. Could you give me the name or describe one of the three phases? Oh, I forgot to give you money for that, by the way. Good answer. <laughs> one of the three phases. Can you describe it or... Oh, you looked at your notes. Sorry. Um, the first one would be the revolutionary phase. It was basically when, like, the proletariat or working class uprising. Yep, and what are they taking? They're taking all the private property. Yeah, exactly. The revolutionary phase, the proletariat rises up and violently takes uh, all of the means of production, private property. From middle class. So they give it up, great. If they don't, which a lot won't, of course, uh, they do it violently. All right, fair enough. Okay, uh, and then when's, what's the second phase called, or what are they doing in it at least? Do you know it? Um, isn't it like the socialist? Um, socialist phase, yeah. Socialist phase, yeah. That's the only, that's the furthest same one's ever gotten. So, uh, what are they doing there? That's when they're like, is it when they're like splitting everything up? Yes, who is? Exactly. So the working class forms a uh, despotic government, and they are going to distribute everything equally uh, for a for a temporary time period. All right, cool. But no one ever gets beyond that, and we'll talk about why today. And what's that last phase supposed to be? Uh, just communism. Yep, communist phase. And the whole world is in peace or a utopia. Yeah, but how? You're uh, right. Because there's no. There's nothing that's separating from a person to a person. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. so you have the socialist phase until all countries have this revolution, and then uh, you would end all borders, because borders are just private property, essentially. So you end all private property eventually, and then everyone works in the commune and does what they do best and, 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 and uh, gets what they need from other people. They, they sort of trade for it, I guess. <clears throat> well done. Cool. <coughs> and uh, we do have some regimes that attempt this, and I'll talk about them specifically. We've got the, uh, oh, this is for another class. I'm gonna leave it up there so I don't forget, though. Uh, we have uh, Russia, which changes its name to the Soviet Union. Uh, we have China. Uh, we have Cambodia. You have lots more, by the way, that end up trying this. A bunch of states in Africa, Tanzania, uh, Ethiopia. And even if they don't do communism, they do some form of socialist-type phase, too. Um, you got Cuba, Venezuela, 
Vietnam, uh, all, all kinds of countries, uh, North Korea, uh, all kinds of countries try this out. They all have a very similar result, which we'll go over here in a second. So yesterday, I drew like a grid, right? Uh, and uh, we talked about how, and you know this just by living in the world, not everybody's equally good at everything. We, can, we all agree on that. We're not all equally good at tennis or basketball or math or, or writing or speeches. We're all, uh, we, there's some variance there. Some people are super good and some people are super bad and then most people are kind of in the middle. Okay, what happens over time, if I go laissez-faire and I don't have any intervention whatsoever, what happens over time in any industry, whether it's farming uh, or, or making music or basketball, anything? Yeah, exactly. Um, and this was a zero-sum game, by the way, what that means is there's only a certain, it's like a fixed wealth idea, there's only a certain amount of land in the world. So if that were true, uh, eventually these people that are either really intelligent or really good or really uh, um, uh, um, motivated, they really enjoy the, what they're doing, or they're tyrannical, right, they're just taking it by force, um, they eventually, the people that are like a 10 out of 10 super good and people are one terrible or don't like it, eventually what happens is the people up here, the 10s, 8s, and 9s, end up owning everything. And that would suck if all there was to do was, in this case, farming. But is that how it actually is? Is there, can you only farm? Is that the only job you can perform in the entire world? No. no. It's not a zero sum game because there's lots of other things you can do. And we know through capitalism, you can actually create wealth, right? Through loaning and the multiplier effect. So you can't just hold all the money in the world because there's new money popping up all over the place. So, um, Marxists and, and radical leftists have a, have a point, uh, and we talked about this yesterday. Could you get really good and then use your excess supply or money or whatever to take things by force tyrannically? Yeah, yeah. yeah. and people do. Have, they have over history. So you have two ways to do this. Number one, tyrannically. Absolutely. Uh, but is there one way that's not tyrannical? Yeah, just being really competent. Right, and why, why, by the way, do we actually want competent people running the farms and not the ones and twos and threes? Why does that benefit everyone, not just them? Because they're gonna innovate and make more. Right? Yeah, they'll innovate and make way more, right? So we get more food, and it doesn't matter what industry it is. It could be, like I said, music or car making or, or, or space exploration or deep sea exploration or making shoes, it doesn't matter. You want the people that are competent doing it. But it's really hard to, to determine uh, which one they are. All right, Marxists and radical leftists don't believe this exists. They believe only this exists. So their plan is to wipe out uh, all these people that hold all the stuff and split it amongst everybody, right? They think they're doing the world a favor and, and they don't know any better. You can't really blame them per se because uh, no one had tried this, but after you know, we tried a bunch of times and we know it doesn't work, then you can kind of blame them. But they don't know that. So all these regimes eventually uh, try this plan out, whether it's in the early 20th century or the mid 20th century or the late 20th century. Um, they're all going to try this at different times in different cultures and different scenarios, and it's going to be the same result every time. So here's what happens. And uh, I'll give you a couple specific examples, but it's a pretty basic formula here. When they uh, institute phase one, which is taking through force all of the private property in the world, all right, I don't just mean the land, I mean factories, mines, everything that has to do with industry. They go in and they uh, wipe it out. So they either take it by force, uh, or if you resist, they kill you and imprison you. So what happens to uh, both of these groups when the communists do that? Because again, there's some people that are doing this tyrannically, uh, abusing their power, and there's some people that are just really good at what they do. What happens to both these groups when that phase occurs? Yeah, they, they just disappear, whether by force, imprisonment, or, or they end up getting killed. Wipes them out. So hey, look, we got rid of some of the bad guys. Great, oh, but we also wiped out a whole bunch of people that are not bad at all. They're totally innocent and they're actually really good at what they do. All right, so this phase one uh, causes um, a lot of death. So I don't know how to phrase this exactly, but uh, you have large scale imprisonment, uh, exile, uh, and death. 
all right? This is actually, I have to mention, uh, the least, what's the word I'm looking for? The least, uh, 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 <clears throat> when there's a lot of deaths, not tragic, I mean, it is tragic, but the, uh, the casualties, I don't know why I couldn't think of the word casualties. The casualties are actually the lowest in this phase. You would think it wouldn't be, because you're going out and killing people and imprisoning them. But this is actually the, the lightest phase of, uh, of casualties, all right? Let's, uh, just to put this into scale a little bit, Hitler's goal, right, because he's, he's far right and he thought that they were inferior races instead of classes. He was deliberately trying to kill inferior races, correct? Yes. At least after 1942, he certainly was. Okay. Anybody know how many he successfully killed after trying as best as he could to wipe out as many as he could in that area of Europe? I think six. That was Jews, yes, but total, because we didn't include also Slavs and other groups, oh. it's, it's between uh, 11 and 12 million. That's a hell of a lot, all right? So Hitler's death total, literally trying just to wipe people out. Uh, Hitler's death total, again, I'm not, don't confuse him with a uh, communist, because he's not, he's a fascist, he's on the far right. But the idea is the same in dividing groups into good and bad and wiping out the bad groups. Uh, Hitler is responsible for the death for about 11 million in the Holocaust, <clears throat> all right? These guys that run these countries, so all these are named, Stalin's the first one in the Soviet Union, Mao Zedong, in China and Pol Pot here in Cambodia. Oh, Pol Pot. Yep. <clears throat> Anybody want to take a guess as to how many these people killed in their during their regimes when they implement this plan? How about this? Who do you think is higher? China. China. Okay, China is actually the highest. Anybody want to take a guess as to how many died under Mao's regime? And we'll talk about exactly how. Forty million. Good guess. That is a really good guess. Forty million. Yeah, no, that's the lower end. Uh, the estimates are roughly either 40. I've seen some estimates as high as 100 million. Oh, that sounds a little high. The, the, the most realistic estimates are uh, uh, 40 to 65 million. Yeah, it was on the highest. That is the highest one. Okay. Anybody know what uh, Russia's uh, death total, estimated death total was from all this? It is closer to 20 million. I think it's uh, around um, uh, 15. To 20 million. Yeah. This, by the way, is not including when he goes crazy and thinks his military and government are going against him and has the Great Purge and kills a couple million people like that. I'm not even including that. I'm just talking about trying to implement this economic system. All right. Pol Pot's number is lower, but let me let me give you some scale here. So this number is actually lower. It's going to be 2.2 million, and that's still a lot. Right. But there's only about 7 million people in Cambodia. Uh, so he wiped out close to uh, half, 3.5 million, be about half. He was wiping out about half of the people there. All right, so the, the scale on that one is what's, what's really uh, relevant. And you've got other examples too in Cuba and Vietnam and all of those, but these are the more well-known uh, and, and extreme. Nonetheless, they happen. So communism alone has killed over 100 million people in the 20th century. So it's, it's, it's somewhere close to 10 times what Hitler did. Uh, and they weren't even intentionally trying to do it. So first of all, let me, let me, let me talk about how. They go out and they wipe them out by force, but that was that barely even touched these numbers as far as how many people were killed. This is probably, depending on the regime, uh, in the hundreds of thousands, which is still terrible. I'm not saying that it isn't. You either die, are forced to leave, or you are sent off to a labor camp to work yourself to death, which is probably the worst of all of those. Uh, but this is actually the lowest death total. The second and highest death total is an unintended consequence. And this happens in all of these regimes, in every communist regime, even, even Vietnam, even uh, Cuba. Phase two, sorry, not phase two. Phase one, of course, revolutionary phase, take by force. When they get to phase two, and they try to distribute the land and, and live like that, and have peasants and all the people uh, farm uh, as they would normally, they have every single time massive famine. And that is the one that kills by far the most people. It's a totally unintended consequence and what is killing is not even the people they thought were evil, these landlords uh, or kulaks, which are like rich peasants that got wealthy because they sold, uh, uh, they, they farmed well. Um, they're killing everybody, whether they were working class or not before. Why would I have a massive famine every single time after I, I wipe out uh, these guys here? Because <coughs> most of the competent farmers just got Exactly. I wiped out some tyrannical guys, some evil guys that, that did not deserve to be where they were, <coughs> yes. But I also wiped out the people that were really good at farming. So the people that 
um, are handed the land afterwards, they just aren't as good at that particular skill. So not enough food is produced, and what you have is uh, mass starvation. Uh, and that is where the biggest death total comes from. And that's why communism actually ends up being uh, worse to a degree than any of these far right regimes. Like they're both intentionally killing people, and that's awful because most of these people are innocent. But communism has the unintended secondary side effect of wiping out a whole bunch of people that it thought were good uh, because they end up starving to death. Um, and not just, not just agriculture, by the way, all sectors fail because you just wiped out all the tyrannical people, fair enough, but you also wiped out all the people that are good at what they do. So now you have less innovation, less production in all fields uh, and your economy just tanks. But we're not done though. There's a third wave that they end up killing people because every single time this happens, so it's like, yay, we wiped out the good people. Oh no, what the hell happened? Uh, everything's working horribly. Every single time these regimes, do you think that they self-reflect and go, maybe we were wrong, maybe we should change our ways? No. no. What do you think their explanation is for why the system is failing? There's still people out there. There's still bad people out there that are stealing everything from us, right? So they go through this third wave of uh, trying to, I don't know how to phrase this exactly, trying to uh, weed out uh, the, the secret middle class that's out there still. Uh, sabotaging things for everybody else and keeping all the grain and all the stuff to themselves. So then they go on this uh, third wave of just wiping out anyone they accuse as being capitalist or, or, or uh, uh, greedy or, or, or however they want to phrase it. Um, or anyone that's expressing any sort of discontent with the system that they, they assume that they are these evil middle class people that are sabotaging it uh, and, they, and they wipe out a, a third wave. So this is actually the lowest death total. And this is of course the highest uh, and this is uh, somewhere close in between uh, the two. Uh, and this has happened, this is a very common model. Uh, it's happened in all of these regimes. Um, again, wipe out everybody, both groups, have a massive famine, then you know, don't blame yourself or the system, uh, blame these secret middle class people that are out there sabotaging, and then go out there for another round of killing people, who at this point, it's like you're just making up who you're, who you're killing. <clears throat> you're just killing people you don't like because they're expressing that they're not happy that they're dying of famine. All right. Um, so, a couple examples, that, that's, that's the gist of it, and this is why, by the way, uh, this ideology does not work. Uh, you cannot just break people up into groups and say this group's bad, this group's good, because we all know that there's individuals in there that, that vary wildly as far as being good and bad. But also, uh, not everyone who does well is, does well because they're tyrannical. There are definitely some people out there who are just genuinely good at what they do. And if you get rid of them, uh, you do so at the human cost uh, and suffering. Uh, high human cost is human suffering uh, to do it. And of course, these regimes are so oppressive and refusing to admit that they're wrong, they often go for a third wave of extra oppressive um, activities. So some specific examples for this. The first round uh, was called de -kulakization. Kulaks, by the way, were just the name for peasants who did really well. They were guys that did really well with their land and made extra money and, and started buying off other of people's uh, plots. So they, of course, thought they were evil and killed them, caused a famine. Uh, and then, uh, during this third phase, when they were trying to blame people for this, uh, you had what's called the Holmdomer genocide, where Stalin deliberately uh, persecuted uh, a group of people called Ukrainians who were discontent with how things were going. Uh, and that death total was um, anywhere from six to eight million people starving to death, uh, and the Kulaks as well. Several thousand killed uh, during the extermination program, and then six to seven more million people dying from the famine afterwards. Um, Mao, of course, takes the cake on most uh, on the highest death total. Uh, his first program called the Great Leap Forward. What a great name that was! Actually, uh, leapt them like twenty steps backwards. Uh, that was where they wiped out all of the landlords and successful <coughs> people and professionals, and they tried to have uh, peasants who have no training in, in, in iron making or anything make iron in their backyards and, um, and farm, yeah, for everybody. And so they, all they had was this crappy iron that nobody wanted or could use and not enough of it and then not enough food, so everyone starves. And then when everyone started saying this is a terrible system, we're all dying of starvation, uh, he issued the Cultural Revolution which he tried to root out all of the um, uh, hiding middle class people and killed another wave of, of tens of millions in doing that. And this one was extra weird, guys. <clears throat> this was where, I encourage you to look up pictures of this stuff. This is where he tried to make everyone the same 
uh, because he thought that the middle class people were trying to be too individualistic and, 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 and get stuff for themselves. So he required everyone to dress the same, have the same haircut. And I mean everyone, by the way, like males and females. Uh, they all had to carry this book of quotes from him uh, so that everyone had the same source of knowledge. Uh, and they literally tried to make everybody like this uh, robot version that's completely the same as everyone else. Uh, it was it was ridiculous. Uh, and of course, they killed off any teachers, intellectuals, specialists, or anyone that voiced discontent about everyone dying from famine. Uh, and he had millions more dying. And the last example, Pol Pot, uh, he had what are called his killing fields, which are where he would target anybody he saw as a capitalist, uh, whether they were... Uh, other Cambodians, or they were Vietnamese people, or they were Christians, or Buddhists, or whatever. He targeted anybody that wasn't a communist. So if you had a religion, or you weren't Cambodian, or you were a capitalist, you got wiped out uh, or left. Um, and that, of course, kills 2.2 million, which looks small in these totals, but again, scale here, Cambodia only had about 7 million people, so that was close-ish to half of all of them. Uh, and then a lot more actually left and came over here and, and other places. So this is what happens when you implement uh, Marxism and you try to define everyone by their group. It just doesn't work, and uh, that's why I wanted you guys to, uh, to know. So the reason why I, I, I told you all this is it's kind of some history stuff too, is uh, you should know why these people were so upset, and they had a reason to be, right? We had cronyism, we had um, monopolies, we had terrible working conditions, and the government stopping the working class. Uh, so some people responded this way by attacking the middle class, but that was definitely the wrong approach. The right approach we've had uh, has been the classical liberal approach, where you're, where you're doing your best to weed out, not through killing them, by the way, you're trying your best to weed out these guys and uh, punish them, uh, you know, fine them, imprison them for, uh, for, for participating in practices that are illegal, um, adding regulations so they can't do things that are actually detrimental to people, like monopolizing or, or bribing senators and things like that. Uh, and we're trying to uh, increase the amount of people that are purely there because they're good at what they do. All right, so that's been our goal, and, and we've done a good job of that. We're not done. I mean, we just had a, a recession in 2008 because a bunch of uh, uh, shady investment uh, bankers uh, and real estate investors were uh, doing some very dishonest and damaging things, and that, of course, caused this massive recession for all of us. If you ever see a movie called The Big Short, it is a great movie as far as showing what happened in 2008 and how a few guys... Uh, in the uh, um, uh, real estate and banking and investing uh, uh, business just screwed up for everybody. And it's really, it's really well made too. It's like a, a, a high production cost film. It's got like Steve Carell and <coughs> Ryan Gosling and somebody else is big in there too, I forget. But it's really well made. And they actually do a good job of explaining it too. Because I didn't know anything about all the behind the scenes stuff and they, they kind of explain it to you as it goes through. So I, I recommend watching that. But yeah, that's what we're increasingly trying to do. We're trying to weed out these guys uh, not, not, of course, by going out and killing them and, and putting them in labor camps, but we're trying to make their activities illegal and punishing them if they keep doing it and encouraging this because it's beneficial. So, you understand why people responded the way they did in the 19th century? Sweet. Um, let's take a break and then we'll uh, do the review and quiz and all that.